Alrighty, um, another day, another video. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome the actual people who subscribe to the channel, because I guess there are actually going to be a few of you now, but um, it's like a little bit concerning for me since I've kind of been saying some fucked up shit on here, but uh, I'm not stopping, so I'm going to keep going. Um, second of all is for those of you who just arrived, um, I'm probably only going to be making systems design content for now. Um, which is good because I just feel like anyone who does like the day in the life of a Google software engineer is just like a massive tool and like only shows themselves getting like six macchiatos during the day and like never actually shows the fact that they've been ripping their hair out over a software bug for like the last three days and not making progress on their sprint. So uh, yeah, those are disingenuous. Um, I'll probably still make one though and say, you know, want more views. But anyways, um, Today we're going to be covering partitioning or database sharding, whichever one you want to call it, which is also pretty equally important. Then after that, I'll probably go into transactions and you know the challenges that arise with those. And then finally, I'll actually do a database comparison. So if you're waiting for that, it'll happen soon. But uh, yeah, without further ado, let's uh, get into sharding. Okay, so let's talk about partitioning, also known as data sharding. What is partitioning? Well, when you're a huge company and you have a ton of data, inevitably what's going to happen is that your database tables are going to get too big. So much so that they aren't even able to fit on a single system anymore. Partitioning is taking a database table and breaking it up into chunks so that each chunk can be placed on different nodes. Partitioning is also often used in conjunction with replication, which means that, for example, each partition might have a bunch of replicas of that partition. Okay, what are the objectives of partitioning? Well, there are pretty much two. Each partition we want, in theory, to have a similar amount of data, which means the same amount of keys on it and values, more or less. And additionally, a similar amount of queries, which means that we don't want it to be the case that um, one partition has an absolute ton of queries on it. So for example, you know, like, uh, if you're Instagram, the amount of users might be the same on each partition, but one of them might be verified, and as a result of that, there's a ton of data to store there and a ton of queries on their account that have to be uh, read. Um, if we can't achieve this, and one partition either has a ton of data or a ton of load on it, that's known as a hotspot. Okay, so there are two methodologies that we'll talk about for partitioning your data. And the first one is by ranges of keys and the second one is by ranges of the hash of keys. So keep in mind that I said the range of the hash of the keys here. You don't just m take the hash of the key and then modulo the number of servers you have that are serving partitions, because that would mean that if you added another server um, that you would use to store partitions, everything on the original servers would have to get re-replaced to different nodes in the cluster, and that would be very bad. We want to keep everything in a pretty consistent server. Okay, so first let's talk about key range partitioning. As you can see on the left here, all that really is is saying we're going to take a bunch of keys, um, divide them into ranges, and assign a partition to each range. Uh, the ranges are not necessarily even because obviously we don't want hotspots. And say there are certain you know like letters or keys that there are a lot more um, rows corresponding to that range, then we want to be able to split that one into even smaller chunks. So generally, within each partition, we're keeping the keys sorted to best support range queries. So looking at the pros and cons of this approach, the biggest pro is that it's very simple and it allows for effective range queries. The biggest con is that it easily leads to hotspots as a result of, you know, it's kind of hard to just look at a range of keys and say, like, we know exactly the query patterns and balances that are going to happen at each range. Um, the bigger thing is that even though some databases dynamically do this, we'll see um, in a few slides that that can be a little bit problematic too. Okay, let's look at hash range partitioning. So all we're doing here is taking a hash of the key and putting it into the proper partition. So below you'll see I have three databases. The first one has all keys with a hash up to F22476. The second database has um, all of the hashes from F22476 to R91MBB. And then the last database has everything else. So let's say I want to take the key Jordan, hash that, and put it into a proper database. I'm going to pass it through a hash function, get the result of that, and as you can see, that means it's going to go into database 2, because that's the range that it belongs in. Um, in terms of the pros and cons of hash range partitioning, the biggest pro is that now keys are going to be evenly distributed between nodes. That means that you're assuming there's going to be a good hash function, though, which is it's pretty easy to use if you just use like SHA or something like that. 
Um, the biggest con is that you can't do range queries anymore. If two keys that are next to each other alphabetically are both hashing to very different values, there's no guarantee that they're going to be on the same partition. And as a result, a range query might touch every single partition, which would be very inefficient. Um, furthermore, uh, if a key has a lot of activity, there's still going to be hotspots. So even though the keys might be evenly distributed, if I'm constantly updating or writing to a given key, then it is going to be problematic. Um, one strategy that you can actually use to kind of mitigate this a little bit is you take the key that is very popular, um, you add a random number to it, let's say between like 1 and 20, and then you hash the key plus that random number so that um, you know 1 20th of the load uh, on the key is actually going to be distributed. The disadvantage of that is that every time you make a query, you have to search all 20 of those, um, you know, like key plus random number values and aggregate that data. Okay, indexes in a partition database configuration. So in the first video on this channel, I've spoken about indexes, and if you recall, an index is literally just basically saying, um, here's some metadata where we have a value for a field or a column, and then all of the primary keys that correspond to it. So a secondary index is the same thing. So let's imagine I have a database of ba uh, basketball players, and I have a secondary index on the position column. And so as you can see, for each position, I have a list of all the primary keys corresponding to that position. OK, so let's talk about two secondary index options in partition data sets, because they both have trade-offs to them. So there's local indexes, and there's global indexes. The first is local indexes. So the whole point is to hold a secondary index that only encapsulates the data on that specific partition. So you'll see here, if you look at the two tables, I have two different partitions. Each of them is holding three basketball players, and I have a secondary index on position again. So you can see that the secondary index corresponding to the first partition, or the top one, only encapsulates that data. It only has Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Kobe Bryant in it. Additionally, for the second partition, it only has Chris Middleton, Chris Paul, and Dwight Howard in that secondary index. So what are the trade-offs of the local index? Well, for starters, it's really fast for writing because it means that writes are all being kept within the partition. The secondary index is only looking at values that are actually stored on that partition and don't actually have to look at the values stored on other partitions. The issue, though, is that local indexes are very slow on read. Why is that? Because if we want to actually use our secondary index to perform a fast read query, we have to go and check every single partition and aggregate the results of their local secondary index. Okay, now let's talk about the other option, which is global indexes. The idea here is that we're actually partitioning the secondary index itself amongst the partitions in a perhaps different or random way than the actual partitions are uh, split up. So as you can see, on the first partition, we're actually only holding the point guard and center um, parts of the secondary index. So even though Chris Paul and Dwight Howard aren't on the top partition, they're being held in the secondary index for it. Similarly, if you look at the secondary partition, we see that the power forward, small forward, and shooting guard parts of the secondary index are held there. And even as a result of that, LeBron James, who is on the top partition, is still being kept track of in that secondary index, and so are Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. So what are the advantages and cons of the global index? Well, they're really fast on read, because now, say I want to find all small forwards, I can literally just go and actually check that secondary index, and it'll get me the row IDs of everything. The biggest con is that they're very slow on write, because now every single write has to go to multiple partitions. Um, another even further potentially bigger issue is the fact that, let's say, one of my writes succeeds, the write to the partition succeeds, but then the write to the secondary index fails. We might need some sort of consensus mechanism or transaction that allows either both of them to succeed or both of them to fail. Okay, finally, let's talk about rebalancing partitions. So I've mentioned so far how we might split data and how we might keep up indexes for data. But eventually, you're going to be adding more nodes to the system, and you're going to want to be able to rebalance your data so that it best suits all of the nodes in your pool. Okay, the whole point of this, though, is that when rebalancing partitions, we want to remap the minimum amount of keys possible such that um, we're avoiding hotspots. You don't want to remap everything because that would put a ton of congestion on the network. Okay, so let's imagine that we start with one approach, which is a fixed number of partitions. So even though, let's say I have four nodes in my cluster, I'm actually going to have a number of partitions that's much greater than that, where each node holds a few partitions at a time. So let's say right now that each node is holding four partitions. So as you can see, we have these four rectangles, and within each rectangle, uh, sorry, each node is holding five partitions. Um, 
and those are delineated by the different color. So we have 20 partitions in total. Now let's say I'm going to actually add a fifth node. Once I do this, I'm going to take the white chunk from each of those existing partitions and put those together to fill up the fifth node. Um, during the time that these partitions are being copied over to the new node, the old node is still accepting reads and writes for them, and then the second that copy is done, uh, the new partition is actually taking them on. Um, a similar thing would happen if we were to remove a, remove a node. So if we went from four to three nodes, the node being removed would go ahead and donate some of its partitions to those existing nodes. Okay, so what are things to consider when you have a fixed number of partitions? Well, the hardest thing really is that you have to choose a fixed number that is reasonable. If it's too small and there aren't enough partitions, what's going to end up happening is that each partition is going to get too big and our app won't scale um, because then we have these huge partitions that no longer even fit on a single database node anymore and that's going to be a huge problem. Additionally, partitions that are too big are going to take a really long time to transfer over the network to another node if we were to add one to our pool. If it's too high, then there's going to be overhead on disk for each partition that we store just by virtue of saying like, hey, here is the range of things in here. And additionally, there's going to be overhead in keeping track of where each partition is located. And as a result of that, having too many partitions is also going to slow down your system. The one thing to note here is that say you are just starting out from a really small app, but you know your app is going to grow a ton in the future, but your app is going to grow a ton in the future, maybe a fixed number of partitions isn't the best solution simply by virtue of the fact that it's going to be really hard to predict one number. Okay, so let's talk about dynamic partitioning, which tries to kind of fix this. Um, so certain databases will actually go ahead and create extra partitions for you once a given partition exceeds a certain size. I think in some it's like 10 gigabytes or something like that. So, or even if um, the partition becomes too small, it'll actually merge it with other smaller partitions. So um, the reason that not everyone uses this is because let's say we leave dynamic partitioning completely up to the database. Um, if the database assumes that a node is down, it might try to rebalance automatically and um, give some of its partitions to another node. And if this is because of a network issue, then we end up over congesting the network. Um, okay, now let's look at a third approach, which is a fixed number of partitions per node. Um, so as the data set grows, each of the partitions on each node is going to grow proportionally with it. However, if a new node joins the cluster, what these algorithms will actually do is take some pieces of the partitions on each node and um, they'll typically you know, take like a little chunk from each or something, and then go ahead and take those for themselves. Um, if you've heard of the algorithm consistent hashing, which I'll eventually make a video about, this is actually pretty similar to that. It's basically like taking a bunch of random points around a ring and making it so that that new um, node is going to handle these parts of the partition. Okay, to summarize sharding, um, unlike replication, which is kind of necessary for ensuring data durability and availability, partitioning is something that adds a lot of complexity, and it's not something that you always actually want to do in your application unless you're really forced to. It happens to be the case that most applications, when they're at scale, do actually need to deal with sharding because um, you know a single machine can't handle the throughput and the amount of data that it needs to. Um, also, generally, keep in mind that there tends to be some sort of either routing tier or coordination service, as you can see in the image below, that keeps track of which partition is on which node and the corresponding IP address. Um, another way that some services deal with this um, is using a gossip protocol, which is basically where the database nodes actually communicate amongst themselves without a third-party service like Zookeeper. Um, however, the point is that partitioning does actually require a lot of um, tracking to keep track of where everything is and occasionally rebalance. So it does add a lot of complexity. Um, to continue and discuss you know, one more time the trade-offs that we made throughout this video, in terms of partitioning methodology, key ranges are really good for performing range queries. However, they can easily lead to hotspots if you don't choose good ones. Similarly, key hash ranges are really good when you want to evenly distribute the data, but there's no guarantee that there won't be hotspots as well because of the fact that certain keys might have a lot of load on them. As far as index choices, um, local indexes optimized for write speed because you don't have to communicate across partitions, whereas global indexes optimize for read speed in the sense that they're slower on write because you potentially have to make two writes to two different nodes. However, 
when you're actually reading, then it's simply one read from one node and you get all the data that you want. Um, finally, in terms of rebalancing choices, um, it's pretty simple to use a fixed number of partitions, but it's not simple to actually choose that fixed number. <laughs> um, similarly, uh, a changing number of partitions may scale better, but um, you know, leaving all of this dynamically to a database might lead to rebalancing when you don't have to and add some strain on your system. Um, overall, yeah, that's uh, kind of sharding summarized as fast as I can, but I think I covered most of the important points. Feel free to let me know if there's anything else I need to cover. And uh, yeah, feel free to comment other stuff you want me to talk about. It's, uh, it's been useful so far to hear from actual viewers.